Okay, um, welcome everyone to Six Scale. It's November 4th. I'm gonna paste the link to the document in the chat one time. Okay, um, add yourself as an attendee, please. And feel free to add agenda items while we're talking about them. Okay, um, let's start with number one, um, periodic job threshold. So this, uh, we have some results here. Uh, I wanna go over them and get some thoughts on kind of what we can do with uh, with this. So um, the change that was made is uh, now we're, we actually have the, the audit tool being built um, in the periodic job. It looks like it runs every day. Um, and so here are, here's actually a link to, um, to this job that's running. Um, and so we'll, let's take a look at some of the results um, together here. So we'll go over a few of these. Okay, so what we we'll want to see is here, the results at the bottom. So um, this is the audit tool running, and this is um, the density test that you added, Marcelo, and this is the results that we're coming back with. So I think here, in terms of thresholds, here are the three areas that we care about. So the, the P50, the P95, and the, and the P99. There's some other values here as well. So here, I'll look at one more of these. So I did 11.1, let's look at 11.2. So we get a, so another picture of this, roughly what it comes out to. 25, 29, and 29. And so by comparison, we've got 23, 29, 35. So you know, roughly, um, I'm fairly close on some of these. I mean, I guess the P99 is a little bit, it's kind of what we expect is a little, has a little more variation. Um, so I guess the, the question is and kind of what I want to discuss is sort of um, uh, how we want to look at this, how we want to take thresholds and because we, we sort of need, we have a few data points here and we, we, we want to decide, you know, how we, what we want to use and um, how we want to measure and kind of come up with a way that, that we think is reasonable that we can report or we can gate. Um, so what do people think? Like P50 seems like we're gonna have less, uh, a smaller standard deviation. P95 will have a little bit larger and P99 is gonna be, I think we're gonna see a lot more variation. So what do people think? I guess you can, uh, we would have, have to look at more jobs. We could, but we could already start right now without more reporting, introduce some limits. Like it could be that saying that the P50 below 30, P95 before 35 and P99 before 40, maybe a good, uh, below 40, maybe a good start. I don't okay. think I would uh, measure P99. I can, I don't know. Yeah, that, that maybe, one, maybe, maybe, yeah. maybe good. Yeah, makes so, immediately sense to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah like strange things look. can happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah here you go. Here's a good example. Like here's 86 and even 95 here is very high. I mean, actually 50 is very high too, in comparison. And yeah, but there are more VMs here. It says that's interesting. Here we have 970 VMs, and in the other case, we had 850 VMs. And here, that's 000. the update count. Is that ah, wait. ah it's update count again? Yeah, uh, um, which could indicate a problem if why, like, why? Yeah, so that, that was another thing. I, these values do vary, like, you can see. So, here's I, I, first of all, I don't know why they're decimals, um, like create pods count. I that seemed like that should be a whole number. But this is a, uh, there's quite a bit of variation. So here's create bots count 50, we're seeing 17, 70. It's because they're failing, most likely. Hmm. So the create pods count, the count's a decimal just because there's some interp interpolation going on on the Prometheus backend when we do it over a time period. I believe that if we see vast variations in that, that's probably because our create API is, I call is failing for some reason and it's getting re, so maybe it's getting rate limited. That's a possibility or I, I don't know. Maybe, okay. do, do we have like the information of restarted pods, something like that? I don't know. I mean, is that something we can tell somewhere? I mean, we don't have it from from here in the 
in the results yeah, at the end here. But the VMI would fail. So it's a one to one relationship. If the pod create, we would never get to a running state. Mm. Uh, and I, I would assume that the test would fail simply because the, I haven't looked at the structure of the test okay. to know. It looks like it's created the the test didn't fail, isn't it? So maybe something else was being created as well. Like, a, you know, what what pods are just the, all the number of pods in the cluster, or only the VMI pods? It's only the pods coming from our control plane. That's what's being measured. So it may be the controller restarted or something, isn't it? But if it's it restart, recreate pods. yeah, it wouldn't recreate. Yeah, it's very strange, isn't it? So yeah. Okay, that's unexpected. Yes. This insight is interesting for sure, and the fact so the fact that BMI creation time, uh, like especially the P nine five, is so high, that also indicates that there's a legitimate problem or a variance here that's occurred. Yeah, so in the test, I would expect some, you know, some tests be like slower here because the cluster is shared cluster. So it might have like something else running together. Um, however, I wouldn't expect like failing pod creates, you know, pod creation. Um, yeah. We so is there... the... Yeah, a, a little bit of variation regarding to the startup times i think is fine but the the create Number update and so on calls should not vary too much yet we can yeah. have an error rate in the the uh, audit tool as well where i could see just how many api um failures are occurring like non 200 exit codes yes that might be interesting okay I, that's probably what we need here so um all right, so we need, I think, I think so let me write some of these down. So like, uh, let's record. Um... Or, or maybe for debugging for now, we can like force to collect the artifact just so we can, you know. So we, check. yeah, so we, we have, so the, like the fit, well, hold on, it's like Marcelo, like we have, so we have like some of the, um, like we can tell 404 is like, that's already a metric. Like we, that's, I think I remember you, Marcelo had a bunch of, um, showed a bunch of metrics in this. So we, we can get this, right? So like the failure counts are like, um, we want the like 404s and the um, whatever, the 400s. Mm -hmm. We want anything that we see as a count, that, that's a failure there. Um, and then what else like, um, so we have delete pod counts. Um, so can we get, I mean, we get, a, we get the events here, right? So we could do like a transition to failure, maybe a failure state. Or failed or is succeeded it, state. Is it total or average? Because like delete pod counts, only five pods were deleted. I'm, I'm just maybe it's it's not total. That's why it's, we see a big variation here. Is it like a an average? Because like the huh. system now is very slow, and then we expect like less creation per minute, you know, something like that. I don't see any deleted in the other ones there. there was a, there's no deleted ones here. And We're not going to be deleting the pods. Uh, here, so what, what happens is we delete the VMIs. Uh -huh. um, and that's how the pods get garbage collected. Let's see, is there a delete VMI? I, see. Makes sense, I don't yeah. see it, though. That's interesting. No. All right. Yeah. How are the pods, uh, how are the VMIs getting cleaned up in this test, then? Are we running it to... Uh, Ooh, that's, they might not be. That's kind of interesting. We're just letting them all get to a running state and then exiting the test and they just keep running. And then when the cluster gets torn down. Maybe we need to check that. I don't remember also. Okay. Um, okay, that's another thing to look at. Um, so, so we have, I don't know, there's, we just see a, I see a bunch of different things. This one has a delete pod count. Obviously, these don't. So the, I mean, we, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what this means. <laughs> why, yeah. why would we be seeing them here? 
Okay. Um, yeah, that then... would no, I mean, I don't know when the test stops, but it could be any, a hint, as David said, that some parts are failing and get recreated. Okay. Uh, all right. So let me add. So we can do this, right? We can just do like a um, the number of um, VMIs in a state in a specific state. We can get that right because we'll have the maybe the phase transition times we can do a count. Yeah, we have a count, I think, in one of the metrics. Um, we can do like a, how many are in, failed or succeeded at this point. Um, yes. Or in, let's see, final okay. state. Okay. Sorry, was someone saying something? Okay. Um, okay, so the, um, Okay, so maybe we get some of those that might help us. Um, yeah, okay, I think we can't, maybe we, so I, I, I don't know if we can have this conversation yet, actually. I think we maybe need to figure some of this out there first. Just one so, question. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't remember, are those metrics comes from Prometheus or we are not, Prometheus. it's like a Prometheus, okay. Okay, so we can get everything there. So get endpoint count. Okay, so these are like other API requests, patch. Um, okay. Patch virtual machine instances count. 99. Seems pretty close to the one to one, right? Because we're supposed to have, a, this is supposed to be 100. Interesting. Update. Yeah, some rounding, you know. So because well, Prometheus, like 10 to 1. Prometheus does average, you know, timing over a time window. So we, we can see like very, very small precision problem here. But we can, we can understand 100 maybe for the patch. patch. What's patch services count? What's this? It's the services endpoint. We might be collecting stuff from the, we're certainly collecting stuff from Vert operator here. I see. That's the only thing that would make sense for services. Patch nodes, that's from Vert Handler, most likely. Okay. And that, that seems pretty accurate. So we would be patching, it really should be three, but I, I could foresee it going to four or five. Because it's three so node it cluster, right? Or actually, is it only a two node cluster? Yeah, two or three, I don't remember now. So is it expected that you have 10 updates per virtual machine instance per VMI? Because we have almost 1,000. Yeah, I mean, it almost uh, it seems like we're at like a 10 to one if we have 100 yeah. in row. Yeah. I'm uncertain. Can we look at the other one and see how many updates we had? All right. So here we've got, okay. yeah, right about 10 to one, yeah. a little bit more. And then the other does we're it just sounds too much first time. So yeah. Does it I sounds too much? <laughs> I don't know. I'm not surprised, but I think that it can be optimized. Uh -huh. Uh I think I I did some optimization on one of the controllers to update less. Um maybe I didn't get it. Maybe I didn't do that at the node level, or maybe I didn't do that at the cluster level. I need to introduce a similar change. So we have an expectation that we're not going to try to update a virtual machine until we have seen that the previous update has occurred. Mm -hmm. do, you, uh, do you remember when? You, was it merged already? Yeah, it got merged. I think I only did it for one of, I can't remember which controller I did it for. It Maybe it needs to be done for vert handler as well, uh -huh. something like that. Mm -hmm. Or maybe I did it for both, I, I don't know. I was just curious because we could just check here, you know, before and after oh, the update. Yeah. Okay. That was and the then 409 error code, I think, when we try to update something that's already been updated and we just kind of go in a loop with that because it causes an error, which then exasperates the issue because we then retry to <laughs> update it again and again. Ah, oh, right. I remember that. It was like uh, maybe two months ago or something like that. You know? Yeah. But I don't know how big of a deal that was really. 
but uh, it's possible that we're seeing something similar. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then in case it's very interesting that yeah, the results here. Yeah. And create events. This is this is a creative any object or is the like no no event is uh it's a specific object it's when we create a event for vmi for example to say this vmi has started and we push out an event to the event uh log or the event stream so that that's totally expected and that number seems accurate to me what is it 100 vms so seven yeah. events yeah that i'm not surprised by that okay what's the other one the other tasks how, how is is it varying a lot this number of events or ryan can you can you sorry what was the question can you see the number of events for the other tasks also yeah sure oh, it's pretty much the same 73 74 yep okay close yeah it's fine yeah, I think the real, like one of the big mysteries here is this one shows up here and kind of what's but, leading to this, the, some of the, this, these numbers being a little bit slower than the others. And maybe it's that there's, we're having some failures with, with the VMIs. So yeah, I think, yeah. I think to me, like, uh, yeah, probably the best next step here is let's get some more, let's get some more data on seeing, well, how many failed VMIs, how many, how many are in the final state? Um, and that might give us a little bit more insight into what's going on here. And then maybe if we could start, so, I mean, I think to me, like if we're, if this, if we get this much variation, um, I mean, this was, we've only run this like eight, or nine times or something like that. Like, I'd expect like a little bit, I, I wouldn't expect to see this much variation in, in that, that quickly. So maybe we need to fix that first. Let's find out what's going on there. And then maybe we can settle in on some of these numbers um yeah and the other thing is so to back to the other point i think like um we, we, maybe we'll just have this discussion real quick like a nine p50 p95 p99 i like p99 to me seems like we we're gonna get a lot of variation maybe we yeah, just kind of settle in somewhere yeah, yeah somewhere five, here should be fine or seven five we can input maybe create a, a new one but i think p50 p95 should be fine we can check both yeah what i was thinking i mean can we do like um if there's like a p95 is off where we can like send a message about it and say like hey you're gonna make you might want to rerun this test or something or if p50 think, is slow then we fail or is there like a way to do that so right now so now and then i'm back i will be working the new cluster and the new cluster will be i would say reliable because we will not share the test with the functional you know functional yeah. tests and then and then we can set you know set an alert because right now okay. since the cluster shared it's expected to have like big variations now it's just i would say for visualization it's very okay. nice to have the test and then we check and see and then when we have the test that it's isolated then we can set alerts otherwise it will be maybe too much you know it will start to Still, fail. Um, independent of sharing or not, the create delayed update and get operations should be very constant. The well, time you mean? I don't know. <laughs> it depends on how thrashed the cluster is. So the cluster is thrashed and and it's having problems performance wise. Then we could see. Yeah. So here. what you can have is more update resource conflicts and so on, but that are exactly the ones which we want to solve in the code also. Right? not stamping over each other on the controller side, right? So That's what you're... was you, you said should be very consistent, the create? The the, the amount of create events, right. of delete yeah. events, of get events. Maybe, but let's say crates are failing because uh, other things are causing rate limiting and other problems it's are occurring. It's hard to say. Too slow Successful maybe. creates, certainly, but. Yeah, sure. All I mean is that the, the clusters have a lot of CPU and memory on the bare metal nodes. So the right. the outside effects should be for these operations not so big. I agree that it probably varies on the on the percentiles. 
Yeah, but we wouldn't expect too too much too high variation in the counters, isn't it? So even though if it's slow, it should have like a at least the updates for the VMIs, things like that should be the same. Because the test is not failing, isn't it? It's creating 100 VMIs. Um, yeah. I think so. I mean, I can't tell. Like, it, it seems like it's going okay. I mean, we just kind of, yeah. I can't really yeah. tell from the. It's here. just funny that we only see 77 port creates, so, right? <laughs> But yeah, I, it's not clear. I would, it would be, yeah, I, I, mm -hmm. that is, the, that was another thing. Like, I, it would be nice to see, like, have it, have the breakdown of, and we, like, I'm, we talked about, like, failed there. I mean, it would be nice to know that, like, okay, we, this was the expected, you know, I mean, we have a hundred density tests, but yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know what's happening up here. Maybe the test isn't uh, validating that all the VMIs have come online before. Uh, before exiting or something. Let's, where can we see this test? It's in uh, let's see, tests. Is it density? Yeah, it's the one that it's under performance folder, something like that. Okay, performance. It's it's the functional test, yeah. Density. Let's see what the exit criteria is for this. Waiting it's, for running VMI. I think it's listing, listing the VMIs. When it see one hundred, it exits. When it sees a hundred VMIs that are in the running phase, F phase, it's exit. then it exits. Yeah. Does so it delete? Expect, uh, it does not delete. Okay, so it leaves for the cleanup. That's why we we don't see the delete sometimes. Which is fine for now, isn't it? Uh, we are not checking that. Roman, but the creation. Well, the functional test always delete all uh... everything in the end when it exits, isn't it? Yeah. yeah does it do that? Yes, even? but um, you just for performance tests you have to be careful because there are big variations on the delete times based on kubelet timings. So we are normally between end to end tests, not waiting until they are really all gone. They get deleted and they will disappear within a few seconds, for instance. But if you do performance tests multiple performance tests in a row, you probably have to explicitly wait for them to disappear. Well, it's it's the, the it's the Kubevert CI. So each test has a new cluster created. When the test okay, is so you really just down. Run, you really just run one end to end test here, right? Yes. Yes. In a row, just one. Yes. It's just one, just it, one. One it or something. Yeah. Then you're fine. Well, what yeah. happens? It gets deleted asking. after the run. Yeah. Will, will it? Well, uh, when the test so, is so over, we, they get the deleted. Cluster is deleted. Yeah. So the, 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 so you will see. But since you are, yeah, yeah. So they may be captured too. Is that what you think? We would expect to see the deleted uh, VMIs API. Yeah, so it depends. Depends when you are running. I mean, the, yeah. Tool, isn't it? If it's right. If the auto tool is running before the pods are deleted, it's not. Yes, yes, it's not can. verse. Yeah, and you need to run. Yeah, you you yeah. need to give your tool the timestamp of the end of the test. Yeah, the test should wait, isn't it? The deletion, so that the uh, the auto tool will mm. wait for the I test. I don't know. And... It depends if you wanna if you wanna measure the delete times. Then yes. Yeah, but that's then what I'm also, saying. if it's part of the test to de to measure them, then you need to explicitly delete them and wait. Mm -hmm. If if you are if you don't care about deletes like just about creates and so on you can just ignore the this and yeah it's anyway it doesn't matter that's yeah, what that's I mean it. so if you care about right. that you have to wait delete them manually in the test and wait for it yeah mm -hmm. I think for now we can you know just focus on the creations in it and then we can move to deletion mm -hmm. yeah. It's really more a matter of what the test is supposed to do right now. If it's just about the creates, mm -hmm. we can ignore the deletes right now. Mm -hmm. But I mean, yeah, but it, it's still interesting here. If the if you don't give the audit tool a good timestamp, it may catch some deletes of the cleanup, but also not. It's so it could really be that the cluster had another issue and five pods got to fail state. I would and expect it to catch all the deletes. So I'm looking at how we're doing the timestamp for this, and we are mm -hmm. uh 
before we let's see start time i think you run the auto tool after the test finishes yeah however yes. it's, the, it's, the test. it's actually a minute after the test because we run we get the start time we run the performance test uh the functional test then the performance test i can see in the after um, clause waits 30 seconds but then in the script that we're actually running perf audit for it also waits 30 seconds yeah so yeah. our cleanup is not very nice. So it can very well be, I'm just checking up, but I, if you rely on the e 2 test cleanup, that's a pretty brutal cleanup. And it, I think it also just does delete calls on all the parts explicitly. So you may not see a delete call oh, because the controller right. already sees delete. I got it. Yes. So, so if you think that, this, that the deletes are a valid part of the test, then you need to do it inside the test. And totally wait understand. There. So just to clarify, the reason we aren't seeing the deletes is because the test suite itself is calling delete, which is not being captured by perf audit because it's not coming from one of our components. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. We're, we're good. That makes me feel more comfortable. I just want to make sure we weren't somehow missing something. The fact that we see 77 creates on the pods rather than 100 is concerning to me because... Yeah, a, yes, that's the... Problematic part, yeah. Maybe um, we are packing the pods now tighter than before. <laughs> yeah, and here we're over. Yeah, and then. Oh, 40, 49. That's really strange. Yeah. Again, is it really total? <laughs> so. Um... How do you? Uh, how are we? How are you calculating this uh, the look back here? So we're running the uh, a minute later. So we've let the metrics. Reach Prometheus, and then uh, we're looking yeah, I'll back. I'll post over... the exact uh, command that I'm um, uh -huh. that I'm running in perf scale audit, and maybe we can. Um, okay. Yeah, double check. Maybe we can find an error there. It's pretty easy. Instagram. Uh, here it is. Um, I'll post it in the chat. Uh, maybe this works. Hold on. Posting from my terminal is weird. Okay, maybe this works. Yeah. That's the command Prometheus query that I'm using to get all the client requests. And the uh, percent DS is the seconds, um, like I'm calculating the seconds between the time period, so the start and the end time period. It's like a rate, isn't it? I think the increase sees, you know, how it's increasing over time, isn't it? Maybe it's not the total, I'm not sure, so. I mean, it's it's for me it's always a little bit hard to interpret it for me just metrics um so we're saying increase first rate there's a reason i used increase mm -hmm. increase should be used with counters Is this a counter yeah. no what i'm saying it's increase it's kind of a rate also it's not average but it's also calculates some rates over a time window so it's not absolute, you know, numbers. Yeah. Okay. okay. So increase is a convenience function which returns the total across a time period, which is what I was trying to do. So oh, we're using a counter. Fine, yeah. yeah, but it's not. We should be fine. It's just not giving the expected results. So that's yeah. concerning. Maybe you know the time window should be bigger. I don't know. I can make the time window. I can. Uh, I can budge it a little bit and make it go back a little bit further. Yeah, so the cluster, it will be like a new cluster for the test. It will never get results from previous round. So it can be like okay. a... Um, okay, okay, so yeah, I can play do with this a little bit. Yeah, so maybe we'll, so we'll try that. So let's increase the uh, time window. Let's see if that makes a difference um, on the look back. Yeah, okay. Okay. All right. Well, I think we got, I don't know. I think we got a bunch of things out of this. Like, I think, yeah, let's keep, we'll, we'll keep working on this. Let's see if we can get 
these numbers to be where we want and then we can start interpreting these yeah it's something that i'm wondering is in a case that we are identifying that we have 100 vms but only half of pods were created um we should have a problem here isn't it? if that's what's happening it shouldn't happen. Yeah. yeah, you mean like the test should error, you're saying, or like it should just never happen because of how you wrote the test? Yeah, or we are moving. Is it can it happen that we are moving to running phase even though the pod no. was not great? That's not no. It no. never happens. I mean, it, there's always bugs and stuff like that, but that's it's too much. Yeah, there's so many <laughs> things would fail if that was the case. <laughs> I see. Yeah, I was just wondering now about that. So. Okay. So the biggest thing I think before we can move forward to creating thresholds is getting that dedicated environment. So how far off are we from that? Uh, that's probably the thing uh, we need to. I think next couple of week, maybe in next week, I just I just need to create the 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 jobs to create the test. So everything's there. Just need to approach job to create the cluster now. Um, I will be working this week and next next week. Next week we should have that. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, and then we'll start this whole process of you know collecting the artifact again. And if we see, yeah. I would like to see like a, a few days of consistent output uh, before we create thresholds. And we are getting that. That's really curious. It indicates that we mm -hmm. need to investigate what's going on. Like we don't right. even have a stable enough uh, output to, to set thresholds and. Maybe our controllers are messed up. Yes. Well, regarding the time, yes. But regarding the counters, we can have a some investigation here, isn't it? Something weird is happening. So. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, I think we're gonna let's we'll investigate this stuff further and while while you work on that dedicated environment or silo, and then let's see what we can find. Okay. All right, uh, let's move to the next topic. Uh, so this is tracing. So I wanted to, so I created a pull request for this. Um, pretty, it's a pretty simple example. So use the, the utils library in, in Kubernetes. And here's an example output of what happens. Um, so what I did was is, uh, or actually kind of the way it works is that you can, you basically start a trace, it creates a timestamp and then, um, every time that you want to record in some sort of event, you can add a step in there and then will have an additional timestamp. And then uh, finally, you can stop it and um, have, have it stop the timestamp. And then you can log at that point if it's if it takes longer, if you know, you subtract the two timestamps and it's longer than a certain amount of time. So all I did was is that this pull request adds um, a the trace that will output to the logs if the work queue takes longer than a second. So all I did here is I just had it asleep for one second. Um, so you can actually kind of see roughly how long work queue takes for a lot of these. It's fairly short, it's milliseconds. Um, and um, so I, I kind of wanted to get some more feedback in this. And Dave, I know you left a comment, so I wanted to talk about that um, as well. Like, um, do you want to talk about kind of where your stance is with this and when, kind of what your thoughts about, uh, like your concerns about it? Sure. So there, I had two primary comments, and I don't know. The first one, before I get into the whole performance and log verbosity thing, was uh, what we're actually measuring. Um, it, said, it looked like in the code you were measuring uh, when we rate limited as well, considering that as part of the same span. Did did we address that? I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, I got that. That should have been that should that should we should stop at that point. I changed that, so okay, that should excellent. end it at that point. Yep. All right, so we can move on from that. The thing I'm uh, I'm concerned about is enabling this tracing by default, just always. Uh, and a lot of that concern is simply an unknown for me. So I don't know the performance impact of tracing, especially at scale, like how much more memory and CPU that might require of our components. And I also don't know how uh, how much logging spam this could potentially cause if certain issues uh, arise. So if we're just hitting this all the time in an unexpected way, like a certain condition gets hit and then all of a sudden we're just spamming the logs with traces every time a, uh, a key is queued, 
then uh, that's not great either. So I was trying to uh, come up with an idea of how maybe we could enable tracing dynamically as like a debug tool. And the idea that came to mind was maybe tying it to uh, log verbosity. So once we hit like a log verbosity of four or five, then tracing becomes something that's on and we get uh, log output for that. But okay. the big thing, I guess, is I like, I'm just uncomfortable with tracing being always on. And I'd be curious other people's thoughts on that as well, because maybe I'm off. I don't know. No, I would actually, I didn't see that before, but I, I would also, I just saw that now. And I would suggest the same. So it should be like uh, disabled by default. And then when we want to check things, so we can enable that. It, it should be possible to disable it, yeah? and then enable when we want. Sure, I Ryan, just... you can just add a, um, like in your, you've made an abstraction around tracing. We just abstract, uh, create an abstraction, uh, abstraction around that object, that trace object, and just make it a no-op until log verbosity hits something. So we just not do anything. Yeah, I yeah. also would avoid to trace too much things. For now, like uh, if we are interested in something, try to keep it as minimal as possible. Also to don't increase the code too much, you know, otherwise it, it start to be like too big and hard to control. Yeah, I, so I had a concern. So um, like the, so some of this, uh, just to give some more context, like kind of where, where it came from. So the, I was I was looking at um, something in the the Kubernetes API server and the and the API server has this on um, and I can see it in the log it, it passes by all the time and and so like in terms of in terms of performance like like looking at the library it all it's doing is it's 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 taking this the timestamps in which case we have we have our start timestamps so we have one and then I think I have two steps in there so two steps and then a, and a stop. And then so we just do a math operation to subtract the timestamps from that from that time period. And if we don't go over the threshold, which I said at one second, we just, we throw it out. So it's, so, uh, and by throwing it out, basically um, we actually can log it. It's just, we don't, um, we don't actually increase the, um, the, the, basically the logging level gets increased when you go over the threshold. Um, so we, so you could log it, but we but obviously we wouldn't want to because we, we, when we have expected behavior when we're under the threshold. So the basically idea is that it does that, it records those timestamps and it just does a math operation. So, it, and we're kind of, we're doing these sequentially, right? Like these keys are one at a time. It's not, it's so in terms of performance, it's not massive and we have three steps. Um, I mean, I wouldn't expect to see anything at all for, for performance in this. And then logging wise, like, so this is maybe where um, we might differ is that, so from my perspective, um, if we're running into a problem like with performance, like I, I, mean, I have to set it one second, if our work queue is taking longer than one second, um, I, I'd really want to know that. Like I, I'd really want to know that. And, um, and I would know that, like I would see that like, okay, I'm seeing a number of like it, with, with this enabled, I would see that pop up. Um, but like in every other case, which is probably like 99% of the time, I'm not going to see anything at all because my work queue is, is, is milliseconds. As we, like, I mean, this is 18 milliseconds. This was, this is 24. And I mean, these are, these are tiny numbers that, that are not going to be, that'll never make their way out. So, I mean, I guess from my perspective on this is that I, I think, I would, I think we can, we could enable, and I don't think it would be, um, a drag on performance, and I and I don't think it would also be a drag on logs. I think, and the in the case that the that it's bad, um, I, I think it's a good thing to log. It's almost like an error. Like if we were to if we're slow, um, I'd want to know. And then that's that's kind of how I'm looking at it uh, instead of as sort of as like a, you know, spamming the logs. It's it's really like okay, we've got a problem here. We need to do something. I don't disagree. I'm still nervous about the unknown. So do we have a precedent? Uh, so this is used in Kubernetes, my understanding. Maybe we can gain an understanding if it's always on in Kubernetes and what's measured and let that kind of guide uh, what we feel comfortable with. 
so we could see how it's utilized in other production environments and if it's on then okay then it's proven that at least it doesn't cause any problems does that make sense yeah i mean I, yeah i let me see if i have a cluster available i can just one question so those metrics related to the work queue mm -hmm. don't we see in the prometheus metrics yeah, so we have we have uh, well, it's kind of not it's it's a, it's not really clear to me to be honest because like the we see we see that you know we so we have that uh, the slow work queue times mm -hmm. and we and those have a ton of variation, um, mm -hmm. and and yeah, I mean we do have some, um, but it's really uh, it's not really clear you know what like what's slow and this is actually kind of what i'd want to know like i have no idea like which of these work queues were slow and if we do hit one you know like in the case of what we saw in prometheus like we, we see a few of them uh i mean it would be interesting to know about them and, and have them in the log but it, i mean it doesn't happen often from from my testing I don't, I don't see this happen but and we can even see i mean you can see it in the metrics too like we see a few very slow ones but it doesn't happen mm -hmm. often Maybe that's kind of the point of tracing, right? Like we can, we would find these things when they happen. Yeah, I'm just wondering, like, uh, if we need some metric that it's missing, if it's better to create a new Prometheus metric or create the whole tracing thing. You know? Oh, I think both, for sure. So the metric mm -hmm. is helpful to gain insights, I think, for like a high level what's happening. But I think the logs are really helpful to understand, like, at what point did this occur? Why did it occur? Like, what was happening? With the, what exact key was it? And where was it in the in like the, the flow? Yeah, this will even. So, I, what's handy is the um, the step function, and like, it'll this will tell you the time between steps. Um, and even though this like says there's a change a lot of files, there's really not a lot of code to this. It's um, basically I'm just adding um, into the the kind of key parts of this code, which is, I think I have it around, um, that's a little farther down. I think it's uh, around the updates um, or the, the sync and the update functions, I think are the only two. Update status, yeah, update status. And then um, the other one I think is in sync. Um, and that's it. And so we would tell, we'd be able to know like when what was slow, like we could tell if okay, the update status was slow, which could be like, well, maybe it was an API call in here, like took longer than a second or something or whatever it was, maybe whatever we end up setting it to um, was slow. And so we'd have an idea, we can say, okay, update status showed up in the log, it was three seconds because something was slow in here. So does it, this tracing has also context? So, yeah, like so who is calling can, you know, we can pass the context of who called that. So. Then we can, yeah, we can, we can, you can put anything. So it, it basically each step will, you can take, it'll do timestamps, the difference between each of the steps. And um, so you can get information and that you can pass during this time period, like, you know, what happened if you, if you want to, um, if you want to get specific, but I was, I've only added two steps here, just yeah. about the, the general functions, but yeah, you can get more specific mm -hmm. about them. Yeah, I think it's just very useful, but I'm also concerned that it maybe it should be disabled by default. You know, I don't know if we can put like some some if here, and and then we have like some uh, flag to enable tracing. You know, we can figure out the exact mechanism. So Ryan, yeah, right. I think I would leave with you for this discussion, and we can probably follow up on GitHub is figure out what Kubernetes does in production with tracing and let's let that be our guide for how we enable this. Yeah. Okay. I agree. And mm -hmm. if it ends up being some, something we want to tie to some sort of dynamic, um, like Rossi or whatever, I, I can help. It's it, That might sound kind of intimidating. I don't know if it sounds intimidating, but it's actually really simple. I can show you how to do it and it's going to be an easy thing to, to uh, tap into. We have a lot of uh, APIs and um, uh, ways of getting that information um, 
that makes it not a burden at all. Sure. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. All right, we'll follow up with this one. And get out then. And yeah, and yeah. So this is just one. This is just for a controller. So what I'll once whatever we decide um, to get this, and I'll do each of the uh, the work cues and whatever else after. Okay. Sounds good. All right. We don't have any more topics. David, did you want to talk about the the virtual machine pools, or you, or uh, do you want to save that for a different time? I posted it. Um, so there's a PR now for virtual machine pools. And what I did was uh, I just implemented all of the default behavior. So when I looked at all the different tunings we had when um, if somebody created a virtual machine with our, our design and set no tunings other than how many replicas they want, that's essentially what I've implemented. And then we can go in and begin adding all the more uh, advanced tunings in the future. I just didn't want to overwhelm this one PR with, with too much. So that, that's how I broke it up. Uh, I think it's pretty close to what we want. Ryan, you had a good point about not really uh, having a use case for attach. So we, we want to be able to detach virtual machines from this pool, but attaching them is, uh, I, I can't think of a reason why, and I think it might actually cause some problems. So I'll probably either disable that behavior or make it um, something that users wouldn't do, but there might be a case where somebody orphan deletes a virtual machine pool and then recreates it where those previous one virtual machines would get adopted again, but I, I'm uncertain. So I'm looking into that, but that's really the only point of contention right now that I'm aware of. Yeah, um, I would, so my perspective on this was that, um, like yeah, I have some concerns with attach because of like um, I, I was just kind of looking at deployments and stuff and 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 the behavior that it has so like when you do when you reattach and detach a pod from the deployment and and from the deployment it, it kicks out another one when you when you reattach and and I don't and that's not the behavior that I think you have here but um, it, it was something that that's I was what like, ultimately oh, it happened. Is. Oh, you do kick out. Okay, so then. Well, I mean, I wouldn't. Okay. I don't explicitly do that, but it would be kicked out due to um, the replica count not being. It would be plus one because you attach something, so something's going to get removed. Right. Well, that's that's where I was going. This I was like, I was like, I was, I was like, where? How are we going to solve that? Because we're in this weird state. Because I, what made me think of this is like, okay, so let's say we did this. We have these stateful objects. You know now how do we kick out like you know what do we do um like it's almost concerning like and, and there's also I, mean, I can also think of a lot of mistakes could happen this way and and like we're we're attaching um and we could we could like why i don't know it just seems risky like to to want to do this as a as a use case i don't know like that's that's kind of where where it was um I agree. And that's a problem. For example, AWS has their auto scaling groups, which is similar to a virtual machine pool, even though it's got the word auto scale in it. Uh, and when they attach something to an auto scale group, they actually increment the replica count. So they're, they're doing bookkeeping on the behalf of the user. And it's possible even with detach, they're doing something similar where they decrement the replica count, which I'm not doing for detach. If you detach something, then it's going to, a new one's going to get spun up somewhere, but you know, one the virtual machine you detached is you know yours to mess around with. Um, so that's debatable as well, whether we, uh, it's tough because we're trying to uh, run this line between what the Kubernetes ecosystem is doing, which is what I've aligned with, and what the virtual machine ecosystem is doing, which is uh, a little different and less standardized. Um, so the expectations here, I think when in doubt, probably do the thing that the Kubernetes e ecosystem is doing, but ensure that we allow the flexibility to achieve the kinds of um, patterns that would be expected in the virtual machine world. So for example, attach and detach where we aren't decrementing or incrementing the replica count, it's possible somebody could pause their virtual machine pool, attach something, then increment the replica count themselves and everything would stay stable. But 
Yeah, the um, I, I think maybe that's that's something. I think I think it makes sense what you said. Like maybe we we start with with the Kubernetes uh, ecosystem's definition of this. With to me, I think I like it detach. I think that makes sense. Detach is in detach and then replace. We're going to replace with the rep account. And then I think like the virtualization world, it's like we're going to detach almost with the intention of possibly bringing it back, um, which I think is maybe a little bit different behavior. So, I mean, I think, and then, and which could be, we could enable, I mean, that's, that could be enabled, but I think it would be different. I think it would be different than kind of this different approach than this, which is, I think just attaches and detaches and like, we're going to do something with it and we're going to just replace. Yeah, I agree. So for now, my take is I'm going to allow VMs to be detached. They will get replaced. Um, but you know, you'll still hold on to your the virtual machine that you detached and I will not implement attach. Uh, we'll okay. just, um, I'll think through that a little bit. It's possible that I would allow adoption of previous virtual machines if something like a virtual machine pool got deleted and recreated, like Orphan deleted. That's such a edge edge case that I'm not super concerned about it, but I'll think that through as well. Okay. Uh, one of the thought I had about this, because I, I thought this was really a neat idea to use the label selector. Um, one of the, um, let me see if I can let me open this up. One of the thoughts I had was, um, so the label selector is what would control effectively detach. Um, so in other words, like patch here, this permission will allow us to detach something that will give us the, uh, the ability to do this. Well, not really. You would. Why not? You would or patch the VM, the... not the virtual machine pool. You would patch the VM, just change the labels on it, and it's good to see. Yeah. Oh, okay. So it would be. So you'd patch the VM. So we'll okay, but the, well, the point still stands. Like, just maybe not this object. But if you could pat, if you have permissions to patch the VM object, you'd be able to detach. That's sort of like our yes, our way in. Okay. And so the my thought was okay. Um, do um, I mean, is that is that the way we'd want to go? Like, should detach be like its own API? Like a sub like, resource? We talked yeah. about using a sub resource. We can do both. So, yeah, both is both are possible. The underlying mechanism would be the same. The, one of the main reasons for this is, and that's why the core components have this. You can just do these operations just with kubectl on any types of resources. You don't need extra sub resources, different types of objects. It's very easy. I'd be fine with the sub resource to uh, it's more like a convenience. So you could use Burt control, uh, VM pool, detach, and then the name of the VM and behind the scenes, we would just yeah. remove the label. Uh, one question regarding to the detach is you probably thought about this already, but would I would then in, in practice skipping that index basically and creating yep. another index? For me? Uh, so what happens is when we are creating virtual machines, um, I'm looking at all the virtual machines in that namespace. And if a virtual machine with a certain name, like I'm, I'm indexing, just incrementing, if it exists, then I skip that index. So the same thing, uh, there should be no expectation that a virtual machine pool should go from zero, like if you had 10 virtual machines replicas in your pool, that it goes from zero to nine. It, could go all kinds of different ways. Sounds good. And the same thing with uh, delete. Like when we scale in, let's say you, you had nine, zero through nine, uh, and you want five replicas now. Who knows? Like right now, it's random. That was part of the default behavior. Which ones get picked? So you might have nine and zero exist in your pool with uh, three, four, and six or something. It would, there's just no um, correlation to the index. All right, that was the only thoughts I had for now. I've only gone through a few of these. So um, everyone that's you know here, if you guys wanna, I'll take a look too. That'd be great, I have the All link right. here. I'll have a look on that, yeah. Okay. It's possible this would make sense for our uh,
density test at some point, manipulating pools. Yeah, but we'll see. Mm -hmm. I, I do want to begin at some point in the density tests, testing the virtual machine object rather than just the VMI object. And we're not, we're not there yet. Uh, and I don't want to derail what we're doing quite yet, but the idea of including uh, persistent storage in this flow, I think will be important to us at some point. And that's where uh, the VM and the VM pool might uh, be important for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, 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 the load generator can use different uh, object, can be the VM instead of the VMI. Excellent, yeah. So it might even be a different density test entirely, one that has um, persistent like network storage attached to it. And then we begin wanting to know, like for example, what happens when we try to start 100 virtual machines in this environment and we need to smart clone 100 PVCs uh, from the root disk? Like, so we're measuring something outside of just our uh, cube vert control plane and trying to understand the impact of storage with all these start times and stuff as well. But not there yet. That's a kind of a future topic. Yes. Cool. All right. Um, we have two minutes left. Um, there's not we have any more topics. Do we have any final closing thoughts? Any more topics to bring up before we finish? One thought I just had uh, when we look at um, the one reason the P99 and even maybe the P95 creation to running might not be super accurate. Is there going to be an initial pull of the container disk? And that's going to mean that one virtual machine instance takes longer than all the subsequent ones on that node. I wonder if we should consider that somehow. You mean moving the image, like cloning, you know, downloading the image from the Do we, uh, maybe Roman, do you know, if, well, we pre-cache those images, don't we? On Qvert CI. Sorry, I, I got distracted for a moment. That's what fine. Are we so for container disks, are we pre-caching uh, the container disks on, we are on Qvert CI. I'm pretty sure we are, uh, would make cluster. Yeah, they're pre-cached on every node. Yeah. Okay. So as long as we're using oh. one cache container yes. disks, we should not have to worry about the pull time. That's important to us though. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. We're doing yeah. that. Now, exactly yeah. for that reason too. Also for the normal end-to-end -end tests. We are pre-caching them on every node so that we don't have big variances between different end-to-end -end tests. Uh -huh. Let me see what density. But uh, uh, if you use a dedicated cluster, which is not using Kubert CI, you will have to do the pre-caching yourself. So this only applies to Kubert CI clusters. So, but the dedicated cluster that I'm using, I inst I'm installing Kubert with the Kubert CI. And okay, then, it, then you're fine. Then yes. you're fine. Wait, installing Qvert with Qvert CI or the Qvert CR? No, the Qvert CI has this external, you know, uh, uh, provider. No. Oh, external provider. That's I'm not sure if the external provider is. It's pushing the image inside the cluster also. But I, I, I would double check that. So. Yeah, it can be that the external provider is not synchronizing it to every node. So, because on the external oh, cluster, we do not know the size. So it could be 500 nodes. And it's not preferable to pre-cache it everywhere there, for instance, right? So this is right. really simple. Just make sure that before the test runs, uh, if we're not using uh, like cluster sync with uh, one of our standard Qvert CI um, uh, clusters, that we pre-populate that image on every, pre-pull it on every node. That's it. The one that you're using for the container disk. Okay, so I need to, I need to check And launcher too. Yeah, Vert Launcher and the container disk needs to be pre-pulled. Vert Launcher, well, uh, it, well, we get it. Don't worry about that one because it's a, um, sorry, it's a init container for Vert Handler. So it has to be there. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. okay. okay, we're over. Sorry, I just wanted to throw that out there because it just. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, good, that's good to know. Yeah, yeah, good to know. Okay. All right. Um, thanks, everybody. We'll see you all online. All right. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.